My name's Toby. Glad to meet you. We've been talking through the email yep. with Denise, and this is the second annual Pagan Pride Day. And uh, we're standing behind uh, the, the labyrinth is behind us. And I wanted to just talk to Denise here. Now, you go by another name, too. Yes, Keandra. Keandra. Now, what, what does that does that have any meaning to it? Or uh, Yes, my uh, what we call a magical name or religious name. Um, it's when in some religions, uh, Wicca, which is what I am, um, you rename yourself once you convert and it's that you either can you can have that as a public face which i have i mean most people in the public know me as that even at work they call me that or people keep it just specifically in their circles and things like that um, and it can mean anything like some people pick gods and things like that mine personally uh, is keanu nishan and it means mark of wisdom okay so when when you rename other than just i mean what what started that practice of renaming or i mean is it anything like you just it just kind of identifying with with maybe a pagan practice or something like that? Well, a lot of people see it in different ways. Um, personally, I see it as kind of uh, changing my attitude. Usually, a lot of people use it just in, in ritual, just in circle or things like that, where it changes their attitudes to when they start that ritual. Uh, some people do it as to redefine themselves, and, and which is what I do, because um, I was a completely different person before. And since I've changed, I've renamed myself, and that's who I am. Okay. Legally, I'm Denise. Yeah, right, right. It's not like Kiki on the driver's license. No, no, no. <laughs> but uh, but my, my boss calls me Kiki. Oh, is that so, right? Yes, and uh, my coworkers call me Kiki. Okay. So. Okay. Well, that, that brings up uh, another question, but I'll get to that later. I want to talk about the labyrinth here. Now, uh, first of all, we, we see the labyrinth here, but what is a labyrinth in your explanation? A labyrinth is a, it's different from a maze. A lot of people will confuse them. Um, a, lay, a, a labyrinth is a universal circle. It has one path. There's one way in, there's one way out. Most people use it as a meditative practice. You walk it in a meditative you know, state to clear your mind, to meditate on something. Um, they use them in all religions, even in, in Christian religions, uh, the part of them being at churches. Yeah, so when you say, say clear your mind, what, what all does that entail when you clear your mind? Uh, just empty it of all the stress and stuff that goes on day to day that we all have. And that's what I personally use. I don't know what everybody uses it for, but like I personally like to do it to just kind of clear it out. Definitely helps today having to get all this stuff yeah. done. Just walk it once, I calm down. Um, or to meditate on something specific, if you're, you know, it'll help you with that, that repetition of movement and work and going one way. It helps you kind of clear everything out. Okay, so when when you meditate, is it more like, when you say meditation, do you perceive that as like maybe praying or just kind of focusing on something? It's very, very similar to prayer. Um, I meditated even when I was a Christian. So, um, and I find it a lot more beneficial than just sitting there and praying. It's, it's, it's thinking about it. It's communing, I guess, with the world around you. It's, it's communing with God, and uh, or at least that's how I see it. I, maybe you know everybody else does, but that's how I personally see yeah. it. Yeah, okay. So I guess that leads into another question I was going to ask about the, the spiritual slash ritualistic side of it. Mm -hmm. Now, is there is is the labyrinth taken up in any sort of pagan rituals or practices or anything that you know of? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, I'm not sure. There's a few pagan religions I know a bit about. Uh, some I don't know very much about at all because there's so many. But... Um, Maybe just to begin before, because there's many religions, including Wicca, that will take a time before to kind of center and ground and clear your mind. And so people could use that to kind of get themselves ready for ritual, to yeah. get them ready for that state of mind. Okay. What, what does somebody achieve by going through the labyrinth? What, what can they get out of it by, the, by going through it? They get out what they put in. Um, if they go in and they are going in with the intent to clear their mind or intent of whatever they're doing, and they, they, I mean, they go after that, that is what they're, they're meditating on, they're, they're concentrating on, then they'll get that out. If they're just going to walk it, it's nothing different than just walking around in a circle. Well, is it, so is it kind of like maybe a, a stress reliever, or is that some, a little too simplistic on my end? It could be. This, it could be it's kind of similar. I mean, I've used it for stress relief today. Yeah. Definitely helps out. It's uh, a lot of people use different things like this because it's uh, it's repetitive. You're walking circle, 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 yeah. back around circle, and a lot of people will do that to um, really stress from the day and things like that. Because I do things like that at home. I meditate when I get home from work because yeah. I, I I work in a in a a job where I get yelled at a lot and things like that. Yeah. So I you know I go home and meditate to kind of get rid of yeah. the stress and things like that. So I guess in a sense, meditating does. 
do you can you get answers through as you go through the labyrinth as you're meditating on things or direction or anything like that? If that's what you're teaching. Okay, so so the possibility is there to find that then. Definitely, definitely. Okay. Um, another question I have for you are are spirit guides used in labyrinths? I've never used them. I don't know. People might. Um, so so you're familiar with spirit guides? Oh yes. Yeah. Do, do you have spirit guides? Yes, I you do. do. Now, do, do they, do these spirit guides, do they announce themselves to you as like names or identify themselves that no, way? I ask them and they're ready to tell me, um, which I had one for years that I didn't, I've never known the name, um, uh, but I've had some that have told me the first time I've met them what their name is. is that right? mm -hmm. Now, what are these spirit guides? Well, I guess getting back to the labyrinth, because I want to get to that question too. Ha have you ever uh, talked with your spirit guides during the labyrinth? No. No. That never, it's never come up or you've never s sought them in anything like that? I usually seek them. They don't usually just come to me unless I'm in the middle of meditating already and I'm more comfortable. Even though I do like this and it's good for stress reliever, um, something that meditative, meditative, if I can speak correctly, um, I, I would do more in private, yeah. uh, sitting down, relaxing, uh, laying down. So it's going to be somewhere where I'm not around a lot of people or going to be moving around. So it's not something I've ever done. Yeah. Well, so the spirit guides, do you, do you perceive it as you pray to them or you just talk to them? I just talk to them. They're kind of like friends. When I, was, I had them when I was teen, I had someone when I was a teenager that I talked to because I had a lot of turmoil in my life during that time. And yeah. they were just kind of someone to listen. So do they, do they seem like comforters or friends or, uh, or, or do they direct you in any way? Oh, no. No, no, they don't direct anything. They can give me guidance. They can give me, um, if I ask them a question, they can give me an honest answer just like any person. But um, I'm not compelled to do anything. Now, one I had since I was a teenager, um, she is very nurturing. She's kind of a mother figure. Um, and then I have another that's um, that I've worked with to kind of help me go work through some things that I've had from my childhood. And I have another that kind of randomly shows up sometimes or if I need him in specific matters, usually when I'm trying to find a path out of a situation or if I'm um, stuck with something, like I'm like recently when I was trying to decide to go back to school or not, yeah. I, I went and I was like, what would be the best path for this? Can you, can you show me something that would help me? So do they, do they, like in that particular instance, would this one like speak to you and say, well, you, you really should go back to school or you shouldn't go back to school? Does it speak in that that manner? No, that one actually is not a human form. It's an animal form. So okay. he doesn't really speak, but he just show me things and leads me places. Okay. That, you know, I'll see things and I'll be like, oh, okay. That makes sense. Okay. So I got just my honest curiosity is, is an animal, how, how does it show you, show you things? Can you explain it? Um, like when I was thinking about going back to school or not, um, he came up and he led me through to a place that kind of showed where I could be if I followed that path. Uh, whether or not I wanted that or not yeah. was up to me, but he yeah. kind of showed me this is what could happen if you go. So is it kind of like visions, or how was that? Kind of. It's um, it's not something that I that would take over me. It's something that I would open myself up to. But yeah, yeah. it's kind of visions. Okay. So so is there ever a sense from from these spirit guides, or that do they ever seem to warn you of anything, or any kind of direction like that out of it? No, I've never gotten a warning from one. Nothing. Um, I usually only seek them for specific reasons. Um, the only time I've ever gotten warnings is in dreams. Is that right? So do, do you think when you get those warnings in dreams, do you feel like your dreams, do they can communicate with you more through dreams, or does it matter? No, I've never communicated with my spirit, or with my spirit guides through dreams. Um, I've always considered them deity, uh, from deity, from I whatever deity I, I, I see. Okay. Have they ever identified themselves as where they come from, what's their origin? I've never asked. Yeah, and they usually don't give up things if I don't ask. Yeah. So and it doesn't ma matter to me. Okay. Well, back that was a a side note, but anyway, back to the labyrinth here. That you you made notice or mention of it that Christian uh, churches are starting to practice labyrinths. Do you see any difference in a Christian practicing the labyrinth as opposed to say a pagan pagan practicing the labyrinth? No, I don't at all. Okay. Do you do you think that? Uh, it just basically does the same thing for a Christian as opposed to a pagan? Or do you think a, a Christian gets something different or lesser out of it? 
I wouldn't think I think that anyone no matter what their religion will get out what they put in so if they're in there to meditate on a prayer if they're in there to meditate on something they'll, if they give if they give themselves to do that to, to concentrate on that to get that then they'll get it. Yeah. If they're just walking in there to think the labyrinth's going to answer my question, it's not going to work. Yeah, it's not like the, the eight <laughs> ball, right? That's an inanimate object. It cannot say, ooh, you must do this. Yeah, right, right. So, uh, right. yeah, it's it's what you put into it. And it's it's just a tool. I mean, the labyrinth itself is just a tool. That's all yeah. it is. Okay. Well, we the the question that, that's just being beg, begging to be asked is because you've seen the videos that we filmed out here last mm -hmm. year, and there's been a lot of uh, debate and controversy over hey, should Christians even go out to a pagan event? And a lot of the comments were, why would you even go out to a pagan event? You have no right to be out there. Did, what's what's your thought? Did you, I mean, you were very, very nice in inviting us out to come out to it because I've been in contact with you beforehand. But overall, what's your, your thought of Christians being out here? Oh, I'm totally for it. I'm completely for it. In fact, um, I've invited my brother out here before. I've had family out here. Most majority of my family is Christian. Um, that's the whole point of Pagan Pride Day. I mean, it's it's different because like, they say pagan event. Yeah. And, I mean, if that were like a Sabbath, uh, which is kind of a high holiday, it's a, it's a big religious thing for most pagans, uh, or what some pagans will call a Sabbath, they call them different things. Yeah. But, um, like, something like that, unless you're specifically invited, that's a different thing. Even though we do invite people who are Christians to, like, like personally, my coven's, Sabbaths, we've invited Christians before, but it's usually on an invite basis. Yeah. Uh, but this is an open event to everybody. The whole purpose of it is to educate the, the community, is to network in the community, to make friends with people of different religions and different backgrounds. Yeah. It's togetherness. That's the whole point. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You mentioned your family being Christian. Do th has that caused any controversy in your family? <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Uh, my mother's a minister, and she's a little upset. And But she's she, lo she loves me, and I know that. And yeah. she will never stop loving me. And um, there was a time where we had a little bit of a stressed relationship, but uh, we've gotten over that. We worked through it, and she accepts me in the fact of I'm her daughter. She loves me. She knows I'm an adult, and I have to do what I want to. But she still prays for me. She still, you know, she still witnesses to me. Yeah. And which, you know, if it gets a little pushy, I'll say something to her. But I, it's not something that bothers me at all. Um, majority of my siblings, except for one, are, are Christian. They're all completely cool about it because they're, they, they're not big on witnessing their Live your life how you see it. I will show my light, and if you see my light and want that light, you'll come to it. Yeah, yeah. And which I think is a completely awesome way to take on witnessing. It's how I did it when I was a Christian. So. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Okay. I was wanting to get to that. You said you said you were a Christian. What What was your understanding of Christianity as a as a Christian, or even now? Understanding of Christianity. Yeah. Well, I think the basis thing is the fact that uh, as Jesus, I mean Jesus dying for sins. And uh, which is pretty much what I thought of the Christianity. You follow what you know this this man, this the Son of God, taught to uh, and, and accept him as that Savior, as that person who had to come back for your sins yeah. and, and and die for that and go through all that horrible stuff yeah. um, to get to go to heaven because that was you know what was what was taught, what was believed, and things like that. Which I totally accepted that for a really long time. Um, and I still see it that way now. I think the big defining thing between Christians and, and pagans is Jesus, pretty much. Because, yeah. I mean, the whole name, Christian. Yeah. yeah about Christ. 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 So, so uh, and, and, you know, there are, there are, um, there are pagans. I've, I've known pagans that, um, that still kind of worship Christ in a way of being him being a God figure. Because uh, there are a lot of rebirth, or uh, of resurrecting gods. Yeah. And they kind of include him in that. Yeah. Um, I don't. I hope that doesn't offend you no, any. No, no. Uh, but and I, I've had friends, people that used to be my cousin that are that way. Yeah. Um, and I believed in Christ for a long time before I stopped considering myself a Christian. Yeah. So. Now, now you mentioned sins, which that's that's right. That Jesus did come for those sins. What, what would, was your understanding or is your understanding of sins? What what is a sin? A uh, sin would be a crime against, I guess, God. Um, things that he said weren't supposed to be done. Things that could harm your soul or spirit, I guess. Yeah. Um, don't believe in sin too much anymore. You don't think that's, is that something that you, when you say you don't believe in it anymore, is that just for yourself? Not that it, it never did exist or it existed, stopped existing, but you just don't believe it. Is that what you're getting at? I don't, I don't believe that, I mean, there are certain things that are bad. I mean, I'm not going to say there aren't certain things that are completely evil, killing someone, yeah. stealing I'm completely against stealing, stealing bad. Um, but I don't consider them like sins, things that will like mark your soul. They're things you, 
if you do things that um, that will mark you, like things that I would consider bad, yeah, uh, I believe in the whole thing of karma that it will it will be something that will come back to you. Yeah, which is kind of similar to the sevenfold law in Christianity, but yeah. Well, you mentioned you mentioned murder mm -hmm. and stealing. Mm -hmm. You know those those get back to two of the Ten Commandments. I, you remember those from from your Christian past, right? So God said that uh, you shall not steal. Mm -hmm. So I know that in my past, I have stolen before. And h how about you? Um, yeah, probably. Oh, never <laughs> that. Oh, okay, maybe I have. But, but uh, probably we, we stuff like have. taking money from my mom's purse yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm But sure. regardless of what it is, we, we've all stolen, right? I'm sure, I'm sure in some way or fashion. Yeah, some yeah. Of the word we've stolen. And then you mentioned murder. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we all like to think that, I've never murdered. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can tweak you right here. This is something Jesus said. This is, this just levels me. It really does. Jesus said that if you hate your brother in your heart, mm -hmm. you're guilty of murder already. So Jesus, he didn't make it so much just a letter of the law. He made it a matter of the heart. Mm -hmm. So because we, we kind of know, it's like, I know in, in my past, I have just absolutely hated people before. And in my past, it burdened me, and I knew it was wrong. And I was like, Toby, you got to get through this. you got to figure out how to fix this. you got to get around this. Maybe if you just forget about that person, this will leave. It will go away. And it, it makes you wonder about these things, because if we, if we do that, then Jesus says we're murderers, right? And that's, that's a high standard, isn't it? That, I mean, because if I just go around hating somebody, I don't have to actually murder somebody. I've already done it in my heart is what he's saying, right? Right. right. And, you know, another is the whole idea of lying that uh, if we lie, you know, in the Bible it says that all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. And, you know, that's, that's a strange thing in that uh, we've got, these Ten Commandments, lie, steal, commit adultery, a lot of people say, well, you know, I'm safe from that because I'm not married or I haven't done that. Well, Jesus said that if you look upon a woman to lust after, in your case, think man or whatever, you know, whatever your fashion is there. But he says, if you look upon someone to lust after them, then you've already committed adultery with them in your heart. There he goes tweaking things again, saying it's a matter of the heart. And so what he's doing is he's placing God at the level where he deserves to be, high and righteous and holy. And he's saying that God doesn't, he's not impressed by our deeds, right? He's saying this is his holiness and who he is. So how come the conscience, it doesn't matter where you go in the world, everybody knows it's wrong to lie, steal, adultery, They'd say that's wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Even even small little tribes in darkest parts of Africa, they know it's wrong to do all those things. Mm -hmm. It's like it's it's written on our hearts, right? So the conscience. What what what's your thought on that? On all that, or just well, just say the conscience issue that it's written on everyone's heart. You know. Um, I believe everybody has uh, some conscience, but I think a lot of it um, can deal with how they're brought up, culture they're in. Because you can get people of completely different cultures and, uh, and talk about one specific soul subject and be like, um, why is that a problem? Yeah. And the other person's like, oh, that's horrible, that's horrible, that's horrible. And so, I mean, a lot of what people attribute to conscience is just their upbringing, I believe. Well, I, I heard a story one time of uh, a cannibalistic tribe. And Christian missionaries went in and started talking to them, and they lost a few. And then over time, things changed, and they, these, uh, the tribe converted. And so they started talking about the things of God with this tribe. Mm -hmm. And these cannibals said, you know, everybody in our tribe knew it was wrong to be eating one another, to be killing each other and eating one another. So here you have a group of cannibals that they knew inside it was wrong, but they kept on doing it anyway. So that's just a strange thing that, you know, the things are written on our hearts, you know. So I guess uh, getting back to the question about sin, you had mentioned sin. Basically, I see that the Ten Commandments is where we've sinned against God, right? It's Christian belief, and right. that's probably what you're familiar with from learning in your past, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the thought that Jesus says 
that you're dead in your sin, mm -hmm. that means that we're still, he implies, well, he doesn't imply, basically John 14, 6, mm -hmm. he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So what he's getting at there is that he's about to do something, and the only way to receive what he's going to do is to come through him. So, of course, he he died on that cross, you know, and, and you know this, your Christian upbringing. And, you know, the thing that gets me is he's on the cross, he's hanging there, and he took on the wrath of God because God at that point in time put your sin, my sin, the the lies, the, the times we've stolen, the adultery in our heart, he put that on Jesus, and it actually said that Jesus became a curse on that cross and God poured his wrath out on him. That's when Jesus cried out. You remember that where Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because at that point in time, God did because God's holy and righteous and he will not have anything to do with a cursed person hanging on a tree. So at that point in time, God left him and Jesus was gone. He just didn't know what to do with that and he died. I mean, he had to because that was prophecy fulfilled, right? So three days later, he defeated death and rose from the dead. And so now what, what you've got to do to receive that salvation is repent. Now, what, what's your idea of repentance? That's one of those old words that we used to hear a long time ago. But what, what's your idea of repentance? Um, something I completely agree with, even when I was a Christian, was that repentance is not just saying, oh, I'm sorry for this. It's actually feeling it. You have to actually be sorry for it because that's something you should really irritate me when I was a Christian and when I really believed was these people would be like, oh, God, I'm so sorry I did this and completely not sorry. And, and it would go on doing it. And it can and complete, go on doing it. And one thing my aunt used to say, uh, my aunt's a, a, a missionary. She goes out and does a lot of things. And one thing she used to always say is, say, if somebody came up and you slapped you, knocked you out of the chair, and they said, oh, I'm so sorry, and they got up and they did it again, would you keep forgiving them? That's right. And I thought that was extremely true. And I still believe that in the fact of if you're not completely repentant of something that you are, that uh, something you've wronged someone or done, because one of the, the big tenets of my faith is don't harm anyone. Yeah. So if I harm someone and I'm not completely repentant to and go up and say I'm sorry and not mean it, it's completely hollow and yeah. not repenting it at all. Well, you know, the Bible speaks of that as godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. Mm -hmm. And the, the godly sorrow is you cry out to God and say, God, I'm sorry, I've sinned against you. I didn't, I didn't, when I lied and stole and committed adultery in my heart, I didn't do those things against those people. I did them against you. I've sinned against your high and holy name. So it's a, a godly sorrow. You realize where you've done wrong. You ask God to forgive you, and then you turn away. You forsake those sins, and you don't do them anymore. And that's exactly what you were saying. You just, and that's why there are so many hypocrites in the church today mm -hmm. because they've got a worldly sorrow it's kind of like oh i can't believe i got caught maybe i won't get caught next time and that's basically what what the worldly christian i use a, the little c christian because a repentant christian forsakes sin because he says that sin is what hung my savior on the tree and i hate that sin I will do all things to avoid that sin. And it's not that Christians are perfect, because a Christian will sin, but here's the difference. A Christian falls into sin. He slips. It's like I'm driving around the road. Somebody cuts me off and nearly makes me have a crash and die, and I'm just scared to death, and maybe I throw the bird at him or something, you know? And it's like immediately a, a conviction would come and say, Oh, God, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have done that. Please forgive me, and I will make absolute surety that I will never do that again that's that's how a Christian falls into sin now the sinner says man I can't wait for Friday night we're gonna go pick up the keg we're going out to the party we're going to invite all the girls over we're going to do this this that and that and there's a lot of Christians that take on that lifestyle and I use that little C Christian again because they're not truly Christians if you live in a lifestyle of sin you're not truly born again that's what Jesus taught to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 you must be born again that you forsake all that stuff and so you know that's the Christian message we've sinned against a righteous holy God we deserve judgment which is hell you know everyone that sinned I don't think I, I mentioned this earlier but of course you being in that background I'm sure you've heard it but everyone that sinned who is under God's law we've lied stolen adultery the the penalty is death it says all liars will have their part in the lake of fire no 
thief, fornicator, or adulterer will inherit the kingdom of God. So there's really, there's, as we're here on this earth, we don't have to do anything to deserve God's wrath. That's, that's a, a profound thought right there. Just living this life, we got a ticket to hell right, right here and now is what the Bible teaches. And what we must do to receive that salvation that Jesus provided is to repent, ask God to forgive us, turn away, forsake that sin, and then trust in the sacrifice of Jesus, trust in his salvation, trust in him to save us on the, the day of judgment to come. And that's the Christian message. And that's, you know, the, the labyrinth is what, what interests me just because there's a lot of, of Christian churches that take on that practice, but the, the labyrinth as far as emptying your, your mind, the Bible teaches against that. It says we are to engage our minds in prayer to God and we aren't to take on pagan practices is what it's saying. So that's why I was kind of interested in what, what your, your thought on was the, the, the labyrinth and as, as far as what I know, what the, what the Bible teaches on the labyrinth. And uh, I've been talking a lot. So what, what do you think about what we've been talking about? Do you have any ideas or thoughts? Or? I, well, it's an interesting argument, I guess. Um, a lot of it I don't believe applies to me considering it's not my belief. Um, one of the problems I had when I was a Christian was the fact that the Bible is written by men. It may have been originally um, inspired by God, yeah. but men corrupt things always. And well, you know, it's just on, on that point, the Dead Sea Scrolls back in the first half of the 1900s were discovered, and those kind of sealed the case shut on any issues with the inerrancy or errancy of the Bible, so to say, because we've got these scrolls that came from directly at the time of Jesus' death, shortly thereafter, and word for word, they match. So that kind of puts that argument to rest. But I just wanted to tell you that just so, so you would know. But, you know, the, the whole thing about it is, it is uh, that basically that argument proves the, the book we have is true. It doesn't, approve, it doesn't say that what it says is true, but what is written is true to the word in the letter, right? So it, it is It is a matter of faith. It's kind of like you say, well, it doesn't necessarily apply to me because that's not what I believe. It's kind of like if I, if I walked out here in the street and I say, I don't believe in those cars. They're not there. Well, I'm going to get run over, right? Well, you can actually see the cars and know they're there. Uh, no one can prove God exists, even me, even someone who I believe in deity completely. Yeah. But it's a belief. It's not a fact. Yeah. Um, you know what? We could die and nothing happens. Yeah. And you know what? That's something I had to accept, and I cried myself to sleep that night. Yeah. And it's a possibility. Anything is a possibility. You know what? You could be right. You could be. Yeah. But if it is that I will go to hell because of what I believe, you know what? It was my choice, yeah. and God gave me that choice.